Hello, everybody, and welcome. I'm so glad you're all here today um, to photographing your artwork for exhibits. Uh, my name is Megan Feit, and I am the Director of Art Possible Ohio, the statewide service organization for arts and disability. Um, we work with artists from all over Ohio to provide uh, professional development opportunities, as well as exposure opportunities to make the arts more inclusive for everybody. We also work with cultural organizations um, to make their spaces and events more inclusive for individuals with disabilities. Um, today's program is part of our careers in the arts program, which are um, ways and skills that we can all be better artists or um, participants in the art field. And um, it is a sponsored um, workshop with grant support by the Ohio Arts Council. And we're super grateful as always um, for the funds they give us so we can offer free programming um, to you all. Um, I also wanna mention that the Arts Council currently has a wonderful um, grants program out right now for Ohio artists. It's called the ADAP grant and it's specifically for artists with disabilities. I am going to be dropping the website to that um, grant opportunity in the chat and in, um, in my follow-up email to you all. If you've registered with us, I will also include information on that. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity to get up to $500 or $1,000 level and, and whatever you kind of need to support your artistic endeavors. Um, and I am a resource to you if um, you need support in that or want to learn more about that program. That being said, we're gonna go ahead and get started because I know Lori has a lot to cover today. Um, I should have mentioned what I look like. So I'm gonna do a quick description and then I'm going to kick it to Lori. So I am a white woman in my early forties with short chin length curly brown hair. I have like pink reddish ombre glasses mm -hmm. um, and I'm wearing a red flannel dress with a brown bookshelf behind me. And there is like a bulletin board next to me on my left side. Uh, I'm sitting at my desk. Lori, I'm going to let you take it from here and I'll let you lay out the rules of how you want this to go today. If people can ask questions while you're talking and things like that. So absolutely. Thank you. Um, I'm going before sharing screen. I don't know if anyone can see me in a large view, uh, or not. Okay. That's great. Hi, I'm Lori Esposito. Um, I am, a, a white woman with long brown hair, brown eyes. Um, I am sitting in a in my living room, actually. So glad to have you here. You might see a cat pass by every now and then. There's two mm -hmm. cats, orange cat and a brown cat. Um, mm -hmm. And and uh, thanks thanks to Art Possible Ohio for inviting me to speak today about documenting artwork for exhibitions. There's a lot to say on this topic, but the purpose of this is to um, just give a kind of overview, a general overview. But if you want to know more and more, more detail, please feel free to contact me or Megan um, after the talk and we'll be happy to uh, assist you with any uh, questions that you might have. My experience has been as a professional artist, um, educator and facilitator. Um, and I am also a disability arts advocate. Uh, I work with children quite a bit, including my own son. Uh, to professionalize his work, exhibit his work. So you'll be seeing him pop up in the uh, in the presentation here and there. He's my assistant as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go ahead and share screen. Okay. Let's see if I can maximize this. And then I'm going to... Oops. Lots of moving parts here. Hello, Megan. Seeing some familiar, familiar names. Okay, here we go. So hopefully we can see the first slide. Okay, this is documenting artwork for exhibitions with Lori Esposito. As an access note, I'll be reading and speaking for each slide, Im images for each slide. Feel free to have your screen on or off. Please keep your audio on mute unless you are speaking. Um, you can put your questions or comments in the chat as they come up. And I will answer the questions in the middle of the talk and uh, save some time, about five minutes or so then, and pause. And again, at the end of the talk for about uh, 10 minutes or so, we'll see how we do with time. Before getting going, I also wanted to offer you all a prompt. So please share how you sustain making art. 
What advice can you offer the rest of us for building time in your day or week for creativity, learning, activism, meditation, community building, or however else you define your art? You can put your response in the chat at any point, and I will preserve some time, like I said at the end, to read them aloud and hear any questions or comments. I'm going to meet Rebecca. Thank you. Okay. So here's our prompt at the end of the talk. We'll share what is something that you do to make your work sustainable, make your work doable. And there's a sleeping red fox in the grass. And I want to mention Amy Hamre, who uh, is an accessibility scholar. And, and they describe sustainable practices as building collective tools and processes to get things done. Always ask for help if you can. Be honest about uh, your capacity and limitations in terms of energy. So rest is really good. This is why I showed the sleeping fox. And slow down uh, and ask, what can a person do in a day? What can I really get done today? And there's a picture of Amy Hamry uh, smiling on the right side of the slide, uh, wearing glasses, a short brown hair. I get pronouns are they, there, them, they, them. And they're wearing a plaid uh, multicolored shirt. <clears throat> and in context of this presentation, I'm also showing uh, the Call for Arts uh, poster of accessible expressions with washes of blue and purple ink from hand and hand-drawn lines and numbers. This is a detail of an artwork called Boat at the Edge of a Storm by last year's accessible expression artist Arlo Esposito. Um, and AEO or Art Ex uh, Accessible Expressions Ohio uh, 2023 is now open for submissions for disabled artists of any age living in Ohio. This year's reception, uh, this year's reception that I attended was incredible. I met so many amazing people and artists, had wonderful conversations. Um, so I really hope to see you all there uh, for this uh, coming exhibit at the Massillon. I think that's right, Massillon Museum on April first. Massillon. Massillon. Thank you. Massillon. No worries. <laughs> that's where the opening exhibition will be held. So I'm very excited about that. Um, they're accepting 2D, 2D and 3D work. So I'm gonna be showing 2D, 2D and 3D for this. I know there's also a wearable category uh, for this year and there were uh, wearable uh, submissions uh, for this for 2022 as well. And you can enter as youth emerging and professional categories. My here. There we go. Okay, so what will this talk cover? Um, we're going to go over accurately depicting the qualities of your work in two dimensions. Accuracy is the key um, uh, today, and so I'll get in more details about what that means. Um, <clears throat> but like I said, the main goal is to cover the basics for broad participation, uh, so I will not go into a high technical detail. Um, the purpose of this talk is to convey how how crucial it is to use documentation to depict the actual qualities of your work, which may not be perceptible otherwise. So photography can make work more visible. It can communicate its dimensions and its materials to your audience from a distance. So I'll first cover in camera, and there's a lot that you can do in camera um, with your using, just using your cell phone. If you don't have a professional camera, um, using your automatic settings. And I'm going to show you a few simple tips that you can use to professionalize your documentation, even if you don't have a light kit, a studio, or someone who can help you. Um, so this image shows on the right someone documenting a painting of a butterfly that's pretty textured um, with their cell phone. Try to move this out of the way a little bit. Okay, um, so this slide shows three pictures in a sequence of an acrylic painting of foliage decaying against a sunset of peaches and blues. It's a flat object on wooden panel. And it's, it has a smooth surface. It's also a small object, about 12 by seven inches. So I want to photograph it so that the light falls as evenly as possible across the surface. And to do this, I choose a diffused lighting setting. So what does this mean? 
Um, one of the best advice that was ever given to me as a young artist was from one of my teachers. And they said, photograph your art in the shade on a sunny day. Um, so we don't always have those conditions necessarily, but I find that that is kind of a, um, an easy way to find a diffused lighting uh, environment. You don't have light coming from one side or another, distorting uh, the uh, surface or appearance of the work, and you're not going to have any um, ref reflect reflections uh, bouncing that light. Uh, so I can show you, I've photographed work on the left, um, sitting upright, the upright orientation, and it's a little bit dark. So then I laid it on its back into a, um, a, a laying on just the ground and I'm photographing down over the object. And that seems to work really well with smaller objects. Um, and then I moved the object again to a place where there wasn't like a shadow cast on it. And you can see the difference of contrast and uh, light clarity as you move across the three. So trial and error, you know, move that object around, find an environment that's gonna uh, best highlight uh, the, its, its assets. Um, so this shows a detail, the surface of the same painting, washes against wood grain, create tension with delicately rendered helicopter leaves. If you're not all set up to document, don't, if you're already set up to document, don't forget to take a couple of key detail images. Um, the details should highlight or illuminate aspects of the work that are not as obvious um, from a distance, but are integral to the work. Uh, I like details that show the crafting and handling of the materials, perhaps the quality of the print or elevate the subject matter in some way. Um, sometimes showing a detail is not necessary if you have a really high quality image. Okay, so in this image, we see a child with a blue hoodie and red pants uh, leaning against a bed with his feet propped against the wall, gazing up at four drawings taped to the wall. Arlo is curating his work by checking out how he would install a series of drawings. He does this before deciding what to submit for exhibition and what to frame. He is also hoping to document his work on the same wall as it faces a large window that's letting in natural sunlight. So trial and error, as I mentioned, is important, as well as consistency, uh, photographing a body of work in consistent light conditions. So if you find a good location to photograph your work, photograph all the works that you're gonna be submitting for your portfolio in that same location if you can. So at closer inspection of the same four drawings, um, we can see um, uh, that they are um, on warm and cool paper and that there are multiple light sources, each with their own color temperature. Um, so for this reason, you're gonna to wanna to choose uh, fewer light sources um, because natural white light, is gonna typically have a, a cooler temperature, color temperature, and artificial light in our homes typically has a warmer color temperature. Um, and you wanna be able to preserve the nuances of the color of your artwork. In this case, a warm versus a cool um, drawing which creates meaning and drama for the artwork. This is more of an example of what color temperature looks like in the same image. Uh, this image shows a chain link fence dressed with a torn green tarp. Vertical bands reveal slight variations of color balance and temperature is also referred to as white balance. You can adjust this in your camera on your cell phone under manual settings. You can also adjust white balance in your software, um, but you wanna avoid submitting, for example, like a yellow cast uh, photograph. The color temperature should be as accurate as possible to the original artwork. Uh, 
Uh, so this slide shows two sets of handmade cut painted paper shoes. These are wearables and they're photographed against um, on the left, a bright cyan background and on the right, a kind of gray, light gray background. Um, this does refer to the new category for the accessible, accessible expression show of wearable art. And I just wanted to mention artist Ron Shelton, who showed his wonderful wearable plastic work in the previous show. Um, one of the notable things about this is that um, the background has a color, which is okay. It doesn't have to be a white background, um, but the background is smooth and it's not um, distracting from the object. Okay, so this slide shows um, uh, uh, Arlo again, his wavy dark blonde hair and a maroon hoodie, and he's holding a panel of reflective foil to a very bright uh, clip light clipped to a chair, and he's bouncing light onto a painting. Um, I'm photographing him and the, uh, the painting as he does this, so he's acting as my studio assistant in this, in this photo. This is uh, sun bouncing light to avoid hot spots. If I were to shine that very bright light directly at my object, it would create a reflective spot and uneven lighting across its surface. In another view of the same scenario, um, Arlo demonstrates how to even light on across, create an even light lighting across an object without creating uh, a hot spot. We used aluminum foil on a um, cutting board, believe it or not, to make this object. <laughs> um, and this is a lot easier to do with a smaller object, I should also say. So in this slide, Arlo is setting his camera on a stack of books to stabilize it. You can use a chair or other kinds of furniture this allows for the camera to have a longer exposure without being moved, and that will create a lot more clarity and fine detail in your image. This is important, especially if you're photographing in a darker environment. You can see that uh, in the upper right, sorry, in the upper left hand of the slide, you can see a um, sort of a, a graph of a camera aligned with a block. It's centered. And uh, with the artwork center, the viewfinder is aligned with the artworks center, sorry. And on the right is the image of Arlo using the stack of books as a, um, a way to stabilize his camera if you don't have a tripod. Uh, something you'll also wanna do at this point is checking your settings in your camera for auto, uh, automatic or manual focus. Some phones you can set this, uh, the focus on manual um, and then you can select where you want the camera to focus. At this point, um, it's also helpful to think of filling the viewfinder with the artwork as much as possible. You don't want a lot of background and you wanna have as high a quality um, image of the object as possible. So go ahead and zoom in without cropping it. Uh, the actual image itself. This will save you uh, from having to crop in software uh, afterwards as a part of processing the image in case you don't have software. Um, and another thing that you'll wanna avoid is long dark shadows. This is particularly true with 3D objects. Um, sometimes when you're like, let's say you have a, a ceramic object that you're photographing, a little bit of a drop shadow is nice because it shows the mass and the weight of the form and space. And that's the way we're going to be experiencing it when it's exhibiting, it's being exhibited. Um, but with uh, flatter objects that might, that, that have a texture to them, uh, you can also, uh, shadows can also show texture. texture. I can hear my, my own voice oh, echoing back to me. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Regina, I just muted you, but that's okay. We're getting a little bit of feedback. <clears throat> yeah, so if you have like a low relief or textured painting, uh, showing some of that with contrast of the lighting can be really nice. It doesn't distract from the image, uh, but with 3D objects, um, 
uh, having a cast shadow is great, um, but you don't want to have a very long shadow or very dark shadow. Okay. Well, we're getting to the end of the in-camera editing here. Um, this is an image of, see, this is a 3D artwork installed at the Dairy Barn in Athens, Ohio by Kenny McKillop, an artist of the Athens Photo Project. It's a yellow suitcase unzipped and overflowing with plastic transparent materials, a light bulb and cast iron parts. The title reads, why do I need all these things? Um, so this, uh, this slide really demonstrates how important it is for you to uh, document your work when it is in it, when it is exhibited for future shows. It's very helpful uh, for people to see what your work looks like when it's installed. And oftentimes, if you photograph it in the exhibition, there's really great lighting. You might have a pedestal uh, present. So go ahead and photograph your work uh, after the reception when there aren't a lot of people around or ask someone who's a part of the exhibition to photograph it for you. That way you can resubmit it for future shows. Titles are really important. I just wanna mention here, why do I need all these things? This, this title isn't uh, stating the obvious or something that I can observe in the image. It's giving me a context uh, to read the image. So titling can be a really important way to direct your audience to the content of the work. I always like to show examples of what not to do. <laughs> this is a really good example of what not to do. Um, it's a photograph of a red painting of a red rose with um, uh, behind plexiglass, highly reflective plexiglass. It's reflecting the environment around it. We can see some people standing around and critiquing the work. So avoid ref uh, photographing uh, ref highly reflective surfaces on your work. If you do have a framing, uh, if you do have a framed work, unframe it before you document it for your portfolio. Um, and uh, if you do frame your work for the show, which is oftentimes required if you get into an exhibition, you need to get a frame on your work. You can find non-reflective plexiglass um, to protect your work so that when it's photographed by other people later on, you won't have this, uh, this type of mirror reflection happening. I do have a note here about uh, avoiding decorative framing. This is just something to think about. Uh, what is the frame adding to your artwork? Um, and avoid using glass because when you ship it, it can shatter uh, while being shipped or dropped by someone. It can fall off the wall um, and then you have a damaged artwork. So I'm going to pause here for a moment just to see if anyone has questions. Don't be afraid. There are no, there are no stupid questions. Maybe you have a question about a specific work that you're uh, trying to document or a particular problem uh, that you are seeking some solutions for. Also feel free to um, put comments in the chat. And I see that we have some comments already. Oh, great. We have the link for applying for the Accessible Expressions show. Hi, Megan. It's exciting to see you as well. Hello, Lauren. Welcome. Um, and again, I want to invite you all to put in the chat any thoughts that you might have about um, making time to make art and applying for shows. If you have any advice to share with the rest of us how to keep that going. Megan asks, would you recommend photographing a round object differently than a square one? <laughs> I love this question. Uh, you know, it really depends on the size of the object and how reflective the surface is. Um, round objects, um, it depends on if you want the object to be seen in the round. This is a sculptural term. Is it a frontal object? Because sometimes sculptures are uh, like dioramas, for example, or very frontal, and they're not really meant to be seen from behind. However, they are 3D. Um, and other objects are 
in the round. And that's what I sort of read in the round objects meant to be walked around. So when you photograph it, uh, you might want to photograph something like that from multiple viewpoints so that the um, so that the person who's looking at your submission understands that uh, there's information to be read in that object from all sides and it's meant to be seen in the round and that way they can plan for you know where your object's going to be installed in the show yes a lot of paintings are square but not all paintings are square i want to add that as well but it is easier to photograph a square a square object because oftentimes it has a, a plane like a single planes and then you can uh you're just dealing with the way light falls across a single plane and that can be a lot easier all right thank you for those questions and i'm going to continue with the second half this part's going to be a little bit more challenging uh, only because i'm going to change our view to um to show you my adobe photoshop so i can show you how to resize an image change its file type change change its size and adjust uh, its color balance so this gets into digital correction in Photoshop. But before I get into that, I just wanna show you um, some different free apps that you can find online if you have access to a computer at home. If you don't, you could try your local library. Uh, they oftentimes will have computer and access to the internet. And I've tried these, I've tested these ones out they seem pretty good. They're also recommended on other websites. Photo editors um, can sometimes be pretty simplistic, but they can just get the job done, help you resize your image so that it's not massive in case you took a raw image. Your uh, phone settings on your cell phone camera are set to raw, which I recommend so you can have the largest image to start with as possible and then resize it down to a smaller image. Um, that could be, you know, probably no larger than five megabytes. Um, a, a, a photo resizing uh, tool like this could be really helpful. But there's some other uh, tools that you can use to do other adjustments, like image adjustments, adjust contrast, color, uh, things like that, cropping. Um, uh, and that one is Canva. We have this social image resizer tool. Uh, for these cases, I would suggest saving your images as JPEG. I mentioned that in the bottom of the slide on the um, bottom right, JPEGs are compressed images. They're gonna compress your file. They're going to be easier to email, to post on websites and blogs. However, you are losing some imagery, uh, some uh, information and detail um, when you save as a JPEG and it will continue to um, compress over time. So you wanna make sure that you also save an archival uh, file type. That can be a PDF, a Photoshop PDF, or a TIFF. Um, those are ones that I recommend. There certainly are some other uh, archival fi file types that you can try, but JPEG is not archival. So I just wanna let you know that. Um, the more compatible file types are JPEG and PDF, so I highly recommend using those. <clears throat> so this is out of camera editing, but it is also, we're getting into out of camera editing, but in software editing is what that refers to. And I'm going to pop out of here for a moment. Um, I, this image shows uh, a painting of a baseball cap uh, that is orange. Uh, it's being photo it's painted as a still life object. It's not on anybody's head, um, but it is also um, pinned to the wall with text. How can we improve this documentation is the question. So I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment. And I'm going to share a new screen with you. Okay. Um, this is a digital image that I'm showing you of some dried leaves on pavements. 
that have gotten windswept and entangled with some um, yellow cottony fuzz. <laughs> and it's just a digital image straight from my cell phone. It's, uh, I, I could think of the object that's photographed as an object that I would install in an exhibition as well. Um, or I can submit this as a digital photograph. Um, but just for ease, I'm going to uh, show you all some uh, quick editing and uh, uh, techniques here and uh, change the image size and the file type. I'm gonna go ahead and maximize my screen. Can everybody see this okay? Could someone just give me a shout out? Let me know if it's, they're seeing my my Photoshop. Yes, all good. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do is go to the toolbar at the top left to file. Let's make sure I don't have any questions that are, okay. So when I go to file, you'll see that that's where I can open my image into the software at the very top. It's the second from the bottom. Um, and there I can pull my image off of my computer, off of my desktop. So I've already um, exported my image from my camera at this point. I'm going to scroll to the right a little bit on my toolbar to image. And I'm just letting my arrow say, stay suspended on that uh, menu item. So you can see all the options in the, in the drop down menu. The first one is mode. So I'm just gonna scroll down to, to mode. And this is where I can adjust my color settings. Uh, typically we can, uh, for digital submissions, keep the color as RGB. But if you plan on printing, uh, that might be a, a CMYK uh, selection, which breaks it down to cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. I can also select a grayscale from this point. If I have a monochromatic image, uh, I don't wanna use up extra space and create a larger image if color is not important. So that's a way to sort of uh, scale down my image as well. But I'm going to scroll down a little further below those items to image size. And this is where I'm going to adjust my image. So I went ahead and clicked on that and my image size window has opened. What's really helpful here at the top is that I can see the pixels, the number of pixels. For some submissions, they request a maximum number of pixels. This is the case if you apply for like an OAC uh, grant. Um, I don't think we have a minimum or maximum pixel size for the accessible expressions, um, Megan, unless, unless there is one. No, there isn't one. So I'm going to go ahead and um, instead of selecting pixels, which I can in my adjustments, I'm going to select inches uh, because that's the measurement unit of measurement that makes most sense for me. And I can see the image size at the very top and it says it's 4.85 megabytes. That's a pretty good size. I don't want to get a whole lot smaller than that. And I don't need the image to be a lot bigger than that. Five megabytes is a really good size. I would say don't go below two megabytes or you're going to start to lose a lot of information. This is assuming that the image is a very high quality image. And from this point, I can adjust. Uh, I have five inches by a little under four inches and my resolution is 300 DPI. I recommend having 3 PI, 300 DPI um, as your resolution, but you can have 72 um, if you have a uh, larger width and height. But generally change your resolution to 300 G, uh, DPI. This way, if your image is printed out, um, it's going to, it's going to have uh, the best print quality. Yeah, so I like the file size right now. So I'm going to go ahead and, or image size. So I'm going to go ahead and keep that. And then the next, I'm gonna go back up to the menu and the scroll down and scroll down to adjustments. Adjustments unfolds another menu that gives me lots and lots of image adjustments options. Um, the easiest one that I'm gonna show you uh, today is levels. 
I like using levels. This distorts the image the least. Um, and it's also best for pre-press, uh, preparing work for pre-press or for publication. Uh, you can also use curves, but that would that one's a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to go ahead and show you levels. And the the, the um, histogram shows up when I open this window uh, that has a nice arc. Uh, and the left side is uh, has its own arrow that I can slide towards the center, and it lowers the intensity or brightness of my mid midtones and shadows. And the arrow on the far right, when I slide that towards the center, it brightens my image significantly and I start to lose my midtones. This image is pretty well balanced, so I'm not gonna really change a whole lot about it. But if I grab the center, which is where my midtones are, and I wanna create a little bit more contrast, I can delicately move it towards the right or to the left. Another uh, drop down in this uh, levels window that I can select from is a channel. And I can adjust the reds and the greens and blues independently. So when I was talking earlier about color temperature, this is where you can adjust your color temperature. If you have a very red image or yellow image, or maybe it's got a kind of green cast to it, um, I can add red to offset the green cast as its complement and balance that image out. Or I can select my blue channel if there's a kind of a blue cast uh, to my image. Uh, if I have a very yellow green image, I can use the blue um, layer to get rid of that yellow by moving it to the left. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on from there. Um, let's see, so we've looked at changing the file size. We've looked at um, color and contrast adjustment or light adjustment. And the last thing I wanna show you is changing the file type, saving. Actually, let me show you crop before I do that. If I move to the toolbox on the left-hand side, there's a, a, a series of symbols that represent different tools for adjusting my image. About the near the top, about five down, um, I'm going to select my crop tools, these interlocking, um, it's sort of a uh, type of puzzle square. I'm going to go ahead and select that. And I should see the, some little marquees on the uh, in the corners and the top, top and bottom and right of the image. So I'm going to go ahead and drag those to crop my image. I'm going to uh, just pull in a little bit so you can see how that works and then pre press enter. So that would be a way for me to get rid of the background information. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and move to the, um, the save as and change my image type, okay? This is important because sometimes uh, you save something as pages or uh, save it as, um, a Photoshop file, which I could do here. It's only gonna be compatible or uh, for someone else who has that software. So to make sure that I have a universal access to this image, I'm going to pick a universal file type. I went to the top toolbar menu, back to file. It's the first option on the far left. And I have my drop down menu open. I'm gonna go ahead and scroll down to save as. and select save as, asking me if I wanna save it to my computer. I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. <clears throat> and at the bottom of this window that just opened up for my save as window, there's an opportunity for me to change my file name. This is where you change the name of the file so that it can be identified um, by those who are reviewing your submission. You can put your last name, which is often something that I will do. And you can put what number image of your portfolio, what order that you want it to be seen in. So I might do an underscore one. There are specific instructions as, as to how to title your submissions 
depending on who you're submitting your work to. So definitely check that out um, in your uh, submissions instructions. You don't necessarily put the title of your work um, in the file name. And then just under my file name is my file type. Right now, JPEG is already selected and that's what I wanted to save it as in the first place. But if I click on it, you'll see um, a drop down menu pulls up of many other file types that I could choose. Um, as I look down this list, I do not see a PDF file, and I will show you why. This can be frustrating for some people. It's like, why can't I save this as a PDF? And this is the case with a lot of software. Um, you can't save as a PDF. So I'm going to go ahead and save my JPEG for now. I'm going to save it to my desktop because I know I'll be able to find it there, even though my desktop is a mess. And then I'm going to go back to the top. And I know I'm I'm saving the the um, smaller version of this. I'm going to save a, a large version of this as well, or a archival version of this as well, by going to export, which is in the drop down menu file as well. Export as. Here I can adjust my image size again. I'm trying to move my screens out of the way. Here we go. And you'll see in the lower left hand, oops, sorry, file settings at the top, there's a JPEG. Where is my PDF? Okay, well, it's not offering me a PDF, but most programs should offer you a PDF setting. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and export as a JPEG anyway, but you'll see that I can export it as a PNG and a GIF. Not really interested in those files. And I'm just going to hit export. Let's see. Yeah, so that's another way, another way to export it. Same time, same title. So I'm going to replace the previous one that I just saved. <clears throat> Well, it's a mystery to me why I'm not able to do a PDF. Um, oh, we do have a Photoshop. Here it is, a Photoshop PDF. So I was looking over it. And for my PDF settings, <clears throat> excuse me, it allows me to choose the highest quality to the smallest file size. I'm going to go ahead and stick with the highest uh, quality and save my PDF that way. So I definitely recommend <laughs> saving multiple versions of uh, your artwork. You've gone through all the trouble at this point of documenting it, creating a beautiful documentation, adjusting it in your software or in camera. And so you want to make sure that you save multiple versions of it um, in multiple file types, one an archival file type and another one is a more compressed version. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to go back to my presentation. <clears throat> so we've managed to um, cover the different uh, different techniques that I wanted to show you today for out of camera editing, which we can see the changes in this image of the orange Wheaties baseball cap, adjusting the levels. Um, in this image, I also rubber stamped out the um, pins that were clipping it to the wall. This is a uh, photograph of a painting that is actually coming off the wall a little bit because of the way it's installed. It's hanging next to a title or label, wall label, and it's on a very bumpy uh, kind of surface. 
I've cropped the image, which I just showed you in Photoshop, so we can, we can see it in more detail. I've taken the yellowness, like the yellowiness, I don't know if that's a word or not, uh, out, of the, out of the image. And that helped bring out some of the details and variations of gray that are in the painting of the rabbit. Here's another um, out of camera editing tip. Uh, this is an object, it's uh, <clears throat> palm leaves that have been woven into a teacup. It's sitting on a gray surface that is bumpy and has kind of white scratchy lines in it. And just for sake of time, I'm going to show you uh, the adjustment of the image, a little bit of rubber stamping, which I can also show you if we have time. And the end, how am I doing on time, by the way? I think we have about 12 minutes left. Yeah, it's 146. Yeah. So if anyone wants me to show the cloning stamp tool, I'm happy to do that, but it's not really an essential uh, thing to know, but that is what that looks like. And then here's a, a what not to do image. It's my second what not to do image for the talk, which is um, do not use the lasso tool or um, a sort of um, a selection tool to roughly select a background and then delete it. Look what happens to the edges of my teacup. Um, they're, they're sort of denigrated a little bit and fuzzy. I was really much better off before just showing uh, that, that background. It wasn't really distracting from the image very much once I removed the textures of the scratches. So that's a kind of what not to do image. This is another image that sort of falls between 2D and 3D. It's a high relief. Um, it's melted plastic uh, object um, with uh, bottle caps that have been melted in the oven with a uh, package of ramen noodle plastic kind of wedged in there. And this piece was created by uh, Pete Wusher in 2020. And he's also an artist with the Athens Photo Project. This photograph, if I were to um, crop that object, I would lose a sense of its objectness. Uh, so even though it's sitting on concrete, there's nothing that that concrete is taking away from the object. In fact, it helps the cast shadow. It helps me get a sense of its scale and get a sense of its materiality. So it's quite nice. Also, there's an uneven edge that goes around. It's not perfectly square or rectangular. So if I were to crop that away, it would take away some of the beauty um, and uniqueness of that object. I created a detail image of it just so we can see some of the painterly qualities of the melted plastic in this image. Here's another instance of some of you might, uh, might be submitting like a zine or a booklet, something that uh, has multiple pages. And maybe you want your audience or your viewers to flip through um, uh, the object, actually interact with it. Um, so one of the ways that you could submit an image of your zine or miniature magazine is by photographing the cover and then picking a favorite spread. You don't have to photograph every spread, but just a good spread that'll give us a sense of the zine. I haven't, uh, cropped the background very much, but I did it just so you can see what it would look like um, if I used, um, if I if I got rid of the background and I did use a, a clipping path to create this so we can preserve that sort of uneven edge of the paper, which is really lovely. So some of the things I've done here in Photoshop or out of camera is I've documented the co cover, I've selected a representative spread. I selected the space around the image um, with a clipping path and I've adjusted the brightness and the contrast. These are things that I can show you uh, later, uh, but I, for time's sake, I'm just showing you uh, what these type of details can bring to enhance the professional quality of your documentation. This one was a pretty easy one to document because it's high contrast and it's also monochromatic, black and white. And the title of the zine is Don't Stop Now, a Zine on Female Independence. 
This was uh, from a project that I did with some students on medicine zines. This is another relief artwork that sort of is a hybrid between 2D and 3D. It's a low relief. Well, I guess it's more of a high relief, um, but it's meant to have, uh, it's very frontal. You're not meant to see the back of it. And uh, someone has repurposed um, cardboard to carve out a few different uh, tree silhouettes. Hmm, how can this object be improved? Um, increasing the clarity um, involved brightening the mid cones. So if you can see the darkness of the shadows in the first image, we lose some of the detail and texture of the materials and descriptive quality of those objects. When I raise the mid-tone images a little bit, we can see that texture a little better. I adjusted that under adjustments under the image menu and I adjusted under brightness and contrast. You can also adjust that under levels. I'm not too worried about the puncture holes in the walls. They're not really distracting from the image too much. I think that is the last slide. And I'm gonna go ahead and open to any comments or questions that you all might have. Let's see, we have a question from Linda. Hello, Linda. And Linda asks, how do you change a single color rather than the color cast? That's a very good question. Um, I'm going to go ahead and show you how to do that here. And pop open my Photoshop file. And in the left-hand side of my toolbar menu, let me go ahead and expand that. At the very top, we have something called a lasso tool. Here's a lasso tool. This thing can be kind of dangerous, but let's say I want to take down the saturation of this yellow fluff ball here uh, in the upper left-hand portion of my photograph. So with this, I can draw and select this out of the way, that color. And in the top of, uh, at the very top above just below the, the very top menu, there's a um, there's a little place called feather where I can adjust the feathering and it says zero pixel. Um, I can adjust how close I want uh, my selection uh, to hug against an object that I'm selecting. You know, so if I want to be very exact, I may not feather it at all, but if I want there to be some give, um, I might feather it like two or three pixels, something like that. Um, I'm gonna show you the difference if I give it like a four. I'm gonna go ahead and select it again. I'm doing a rough outline of this fuzz. Okay, so I have a selection. I'm pretty happy with it. It's not exact, as you can see, it's not hugging the exact form that I initially drew. It has a little bit of give. So it's feathering or softening its edge. I'm going to go into layer, I'm sorry, image <laughs> from the drop down menu. I'm going to pull down to adjustments. It's going to open another drop down menu. And here's a little trick. Uh, Linda, you're asking about adjusting the color. I can go to hue and saturation if I want to make the color less intense or I can go to color balance. Either one of these are really good. I'm gonna to go to color balance so you can see what that looks like. If I move towards cyan, you can see the cyan hue coming out of there. What's nice about having a four point feather on this is that I'm not gonna see a, a strong line, okay? So I'm gonna adjust this a little bit. I'm gonna warm it up, go move towards the red. And I'm also going to show you what this looks like when I adjust the saturation. I'm going to make it brighter. Ooh, that's quite bright, maybe a little bit too bright. And I'm not going to go over like 10 pixels because that's quite dramatic. Um, it's going to look artificial. And then, you know, whoever's looking at the image is going to go, is this what the original artwork looks like or was this manipulated? And now I'm going to deselect, which is um, 
two positions down from image. I deselect my image. Now I'm going to zoom in. This is something that you want to do zoomed in uh, anyway. Here, I'm going to press the space bar to get my hand so that I can move it down. You can see a little bit of a fuzz line here or aura around uh, where I adjusted the color, but it's soft. And that's because I used a feather. So it's pretty good. Um, I would say it's it's passable. <laughs> that's definitely passable. But I do see a little bit of aura here. I don't think that someone who wasn't familiar with the image would notice that. But that is a good way to adjust, select and just adjust the color of a part of your image. So thank you for that question. I think we have a couple more minutes here. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, and Kathleen says, I seek to find practices I find both nourishing and relaxing. Working with textiles does that for me. And to work on pieces that I can take with me on my travels, trains mainly. Okay, I'm very jealous. Making art on trains sounds incredible. And that's, uh, I'm going to make that my next, uh, my next vacation. So thank you, Kathleen. That sounds like a wonderful practice. Making things on the move or uh, having a portable or nomadic practice is very interesting. So thank you for sharing that. And Kathleen's responding to the prompt from the beginning of the, of the talk of uh, asking you all to share what, what do you do to keep making art? How do you sustain your practice? And can you share a little tidbit of that with us? Lori, I have a question that maybe you could answer yeah. or, you know, say that there are artists who are submitting, you know, they're, they're working on their photographs and like formatting and they've got these files and then they've started the submission processes. Um, how do you recommend organizing all of that? So you can kind of track like, you know, what have I submitted to and was the deadline? When am I going to hear back? Because I can imagine that can be overwhelming if you're, if you're really active in that. Yeah, that's definitely, um, I call that um, my executive functioning skills are quite poor. Um, so I can definitely relate to those of you who just have, you know, people see your desktop and they gasp because there's so many files on them. Uh, try to keep a filing system that makes sense to you. Um, I've been very intimidated by other people's filing systems because they'll use things like uh, chrono chronological um, sort of organization, like 2019, you know, folder. And these are all the photos uh, I took in 2019. And then within that photo, they might, uh, within that folder, they might have another folder that says submissions, you know, artwork for submissions, which I highly recommend. Um, what I have is um, a folder that's just called professional work. And then within that folder, I have different categories of photography, performance, painting, drawing. Um, I have, uh, and then when you open those uh, those folders, like let's say I open the painting folder of all the paintings that I've done, I have names of bodies of work. So I'll have um, what called the man paintings. I made these, these uh, paintings with um, nude men that I found from online uh, soft core sites. I know that sounds very weird thing to do, but I was looking for nudes who were being solicited on online sites and then placing them within these kind of fantasy environments. And so I called them the man paintings. And so that was a specific title name uh, for, a, for a, a folder that I used because I knew that I could remember it. Um, avoid titling uh, folders, things that you aren't, aren't going to remember. If you don't remember things by date, if you don't remember things by medium or material, or title, like, what did I call that thing again? You know, find something to call it that you know you'll remember. And sometimes that takes some working through. Um, we have a comment. I hope that was helpful as an answer um, because I, th I think it's always about like what works best for you and your memory, the way you systemize things in your own mind. We have a comment from Regina saying, I work out, of my, out on my iPad Pro first then I transfer to Canvas. Oh, that's really lovely. Um, Regina, I think you're uh, sharing a little bit about your process, your artistic process, where if you're out on the go, um, you're using your iPad. And then when you get home, you transfer, uh, 
your work and your thinking process uh, onto a canvas, like as a painting. Is, that's how I'm reading what you're saying, but uh, let me, yes, awesome. That's a really great way to work too. Um, you know, some of us have processes where we don't want to look at a screen and others, you know, uh, looking at screens is a part of our process. Sometimes to avoid looking at screens as much, I'll print things from my laptop or my iPad so that I'm looking at a print while I'm painting instead of a backlit screen. Of course, if there's an added cost uh, to printing things. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit about your process. I think we're we're hitting the perfect endpoints. So I'm going to thank you all for joining me today and thank you, Art Possible and Megan, Molly, for all the work that you do. Um, thank you so much for um, inviting me today. So, Well, we um, enjoy having you. Um, and uh, thank you, Lori, for being here. You always do an incredible job with this workshop. Um, just so everyone knows, in early next week, I will send out a short survey. It's like a four minute survey. If you could fill that out um, for us, that'd be great. But I'm also going to send Lori's PowerPoint at that time. And I will send a YouTube video for this. So if there's anything you want to revisit, you're welcome to do so. If you want to get a hold of Lori, feel free to email me and I can put you in touch with her. Um, and if you have any questions about any of the programs that Lori and I talked about today, again, just reach out to us and we will do our best to help you navigate them, whether that's a computer program or like the grants program I mentioned, <laughs> programs of all types. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, I do hope that you'll join us for some other future careers in the arts programming. Um, you can learn more about what we have to offer at um, our, on our Facebook page, our Art Possible Ohio, and our Instagram, Art Possible Ohio. You can log in, sign up for our newsletter. Um, which will be an option to do that in the information I send out to you. Um, or you can check out our website or uh, www.artpossibleohio.org. At that, I'm going to say goodbye to all of you and wish you well on your days. Thanks, everyone. Happy applying. <laughs> Throw your, your hat in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> all right.